actually, there doesn't have to be an A, B, and C. These can be all three Bs or three, you know, we can call them what they are. And it's just like, follow the funny idea until it's no longer funny. I'm Sharla Lariston, a stand-up comedian, writer, director, and producer. And this is The Working Writer Podcast, where screenwriters, creatives, and industry insiders share their stories of breaking in in hopes that it helps you along your path. I'm so excited you could join us. If you like what you hear, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Without further ado, let's get to work. What's up? And welcome to another episode of the Working Writer Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me once again. As of the recording of this podcast, there's some great news that just dropped, which is that the WGA and AMTPT have reached a tentative agreement to end the writer strike and are in talks to negotiate with the actors to end the actor strike. So woohoo, we won. We live to fight another day. And of course we won because we have to win. What are they going to do? They need writers. We were always going to win. It just took a long time and it sucked. But here we are and we saved the industry. So we're heroes. We're great. Writers are heroes. Anyway, I'm really excited to introduce you to today's guest, David Phillips, who is a writer who's written on some of my favorite TV shows, including Rick and Morty, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, The Sex Lives of College Girls, and our alma mater, Grand Crew. So in this episode with David, we talk about him growing up in Beverly Hills, of all places, as well as both of us struggling to transition from being staff writers to taking leadership roles in the writer's room. I hope you get a lot out of this episode. We also did have a little bit of technical difficulty in the beginning and throughout with internet stuff going out. So if you hear any kind of weird cuts, it's probably that. But either way, I hope it doesn't bother you too much. And I hope actually that you don't even notice it. And maybe I didn't even have to say this, but I did because I'm transparent or I'm trying to be. Well, enjoy this episode with David Phillips. And without further ado, here it is. (laughs) David Phillips, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Who are you? Where are you from? How did you grow up? Mm. What's your deal? Who am I is is an open-ended question. I grew up in Los Angeles, more specifically Beverly Hills. So that might shape opinions right off the bat. 100%. (laughs) One hundred percent. But I have no comment um, on Beverly Hills as a as a place or as a place that I have any closeness to. I don't. But I will say I had a pretty, as you can imagine, lucky and privileged upbringing. And the only weird thing I would say is, growing up in LA, it period. That's the end of statement. Growing up in LA is weird. <laughs> I, I actually do think that it must be most people I've met through the business or through, oh God, already a thing I'm going to ask you to edit out, me saying the business, um, <laughs> in the industry, in writer's rooms or whatever, aren't from LA. Being from LA is weirder than I thought it was. Right. I didn't know growing up in LA was weird until more recently as an adult. And um, I would just say what's even stranger is most people expect my upbringing to have been around the entertainment industry, if you will. But I was like fully unaware of it. Um, outside of the like random things that you get to experience growing up in LA, like going to a sitcom taping that you would do if, even if you were a tourist coming to Los Angeles. <laughs> and then similarly, uh, I guess seeing a random celebrity here and there at like a, at like a restaurant. I'm enjoying listening to you talk about uh, growing up in Beverly Hills, uh, <laughs> which, you know, you said with an appropriate amount of shame. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I have been working on that shame, not just in therapy, but throughout my life yeah. for roughly 37 years. Oh, wow. And I'm trying to perfect it. It's it's a work in progress always. Wow. Well, first of all, it's weird that you're from LA in the first place. Yes. Second of all, you're from Beverly Hills. So you're just, you're so like the version of the, of LA that we've seen on TV that you hardly ever actually meet when you, when you work in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, is that, has that been weird for you to be that? I would say it was weirder in like right around teenage years to like late, like early, basically college ish, you know, you just start meeting people that aren't from where you're, 
you're from and the reactions you get that sort of, which is like probably the answer of literally anyone that's from anywhere moving to a place that they aren't from or interacting with people that aren't from where they're from, which is like a healthy type of experience. And then you're just confronted with whatever the biases of your own existence. And so that, you know, was a funny one only because like, it was like you said, it was on TV. So most of the reactions I got very early on were like, oh, did you go to Beverly Hills 90210 High School? And all, you know, like, is your zip code, like all these things that are much more informed by like one or two TV shows. Right. But then of course, as you become like an adult, there's much more granular weirdnesses to it that are less about the TV representation of it. But I've definitely more been just finding it weird just to be from LA in general, if that makes sense. Just like as a... How? Not a lot of people, like so many people move here and right. it's not exactly as much of a place where I just assumed, oh yeah, everyone's from LA. Like they grew up here and you know, like it's just right. that feeling of like, oh, what actually shapes LA is I think the fact that it's not just, it's not just a, a culture of people that have grown up here. It's all, it's like a good mixture of people that have grown up here and created a culture, but also plenty of people continuing to move into it. And I think that like is why it's, maybe lost like why people often find i guess like la to me feels represented as this place that doesn't have culture and that's like obviously clearly untrue yeah (laughs) but i think that that gets to the core of it is that there's some idea of like oh it's a new culture and people are constantly it's changing and evolving but i think that's what's interesting and good about it and I would I have a hard time defending it to anyone who doesn't like it, but I also identify with people that think LA is a cool place to live. Right. And it's just happens to be where I am now. Right. Like I have to be here for work. Do you feel like you grew up in two worlds like uh being like LA being your home and then LA being the place that you work in the industry? Cuz it it does feel very like far away when you talk about growing up in LA. It's like, I can't even imagine <laughs> what that yeah, is like, because it's just such a city of transplants to me. It does feel like a, like two different things. Like I grew up here and yet my specific world was so small, even though I was exposed to a huge city that like moving back here to start working here, it felt like I was rediscovering LA in a different way. And I never wanted to move back to Beverly Hills, obviously. Or maybe it's weird to say obviously, but I think that Not there's obvious, a obvious reason there. Yeah. But I definitely was like, yeah, I never intended to move back to Beverly Hills. Well, what is it? Because I don't know what the obvious reason is. Beverly Hills is, is not exactly a place you'd move to anyways as a young adult trying to move to this city. And then on top of that, the only way I could have moved back there is to move live with my, my my parents, which I did for a year while I saved up money to like do things to be able to afford rent. But like that level of living is, you know, Beverly Hills is a a very specific place that seems to be aging, um, not in a surprising way. You know, yeah, I, I think sure. I've, I've heard stories that it's just yeah. like at, in the eighties, it was where young families moved, and now it's just all those people are aging and no young families are moving there either. So I don't think it's exactly calling to people at our, in our generation, even now. Absolutely not. But I also feel like I have no concept of Beverly Hills because I don't hang out there. I don't really go there. I don't really know anyone. Like anytime I go there, it's like for a meeting, like to meet my lawyer or like to, to do something fancy. So it just doesn't, it really doesn't feel like the kind of place where a, a young upstart would move. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I, and I think I think that's kind of what I was getting at from the very core of what I said. Interesting. I grew up in LA but had no exposure to the industry. Interesting. It, it seems as though it's a natural like, oh, you grew up in LA, so you knew about Hollywood or your parents worked in it or something. But I just, from the same way that maybe you knew someone who knew someone or like maybe someone that I went to high school with turned out to be an actor. Right. But other than that, it's like my dad was a doctor and that the industry still seemed far away until I moved back here to essentially try and do this. Mm -hmm. My very first job was robot chicken, which is a sketch show. And that was season Mm -hmm. 535,000 of that show. Right, right, right. Yeah. And they just turned those out. And then my next job was Rick and Morty, which was season two. 
Um, and then Brooklyn, I started on season two and then, yeah, so I was really a season two person. Oh, wow. Good for you. So yeah, that was, that was fully new. You lucked out. Mm -hmm. So what was the biggest, um, difference you noticed about working on a, you know, building a show from the ground up versus coming in? I mean, obviously it's a well-oiled machine, hopefully, or getting to be a better oiled machine by season two. Mm -hmm. It's so tough because I was still a pretty new a uh, young writer on those season twos. So looking back on it, it's more interesting from like, oh, what you know, what could have, what what was the show at specifically? What were we trying to do and still figure out for the show? Whereas when you come in or when I came in as like a staff writer on those few first early jobs for me, it was always like, how can I get jokes in the script? How can I just help whenever I'm asked and not try and like poke holes and things and just try and be like helpful and like be excited to be there was like such an early stage for me where I had the privilege of feeling excited to be there because I was young enough where I was like, I can work these crazy hours. Those were probably the the, the most difficult parts of the job. But like, um, I, I was very much focused on like being a positive, helpful force in those days. So I wasn't really trying to think like, what have we not figured out about this show? I was always reactionary to like maybe a showrunner who was like, maybe still questioning what we should do or like what, you know, whether I basically just took what they said as a given, even if that would change the next week and just move from there. Cause mm -hmm. that is kind of how the job works now that you realize it as you're old, as you're like older and more experienced, you're like, what is maybe taken as like gospel for the show the next week? You're like, Oh wait, that character that we thought was a main character now no longer exists. And not only no longer exists as like a butt of a joke that we ever thought that this should, you know? So I think that, that realizing that takes a lot of time. So I would say those season two shows were not nearly as figured out as I thought they were going in, but I wouldn't have noticed that until later on, you know? Interesting. But there was a, I mean, God, it, there was still for Brooklyn is a good example. I mean, they had already done 22 episodes. So a lot was figured out. I mean, those characters were like already solidified. Whereas you remember season one of grand crew, it's like, Yes, there's there's like characters for each that have been created with an idea for them, but you are like we can really do anything, and we need to do some stuff to like solidify these characters in each episode so people know who they are because you can only uh, introduce and like solidify so many characters in a pilot, you know. So right. there's a lot of that work to be done in a season one, and Brooklyn definitely did that. Rick and Morty was different just because that was like you can kind of introduce sci-fi concept here and there. And, but there, that was really already figured out from a character perspective, I would say, and just much more like the world is open and we can do almost anything. How do we decide after like a successful season one that was airing while we were writing it, like to not get overwhelmed by that moment and be like, we can do anything because of this conceit. How do we like narrow it down and decide like, these are the funny ideas and follow those. Um, which I think is a good lesson even on a season one where it's like who can come in and try and narrow the scope because it really can still be anything. in a lot of these ideas, yeah, a character, while it seems like pretty figured out, you're like, there's a lot of options you can go with. And I think Bill was pretty good at like narrowing that down to a certain point, but I think all of us had to help with that to some degree and be like, well, this is what I like. This is what I like. It just helps like contributing in that way. Yeah. So you talked about, Grand Crew being the first time that you were a number two, mm -hmm. I feel like the transition from staff writer to, um, I guess, like producer level or like, you know, basically when you start running rooms, it can be kind of like a bumpy shift for a lot of writers. I've noticed it even in, in like later, you know, even in like showrunners, I've noticed that they, even though they're in positions of power, like they still have that, like, I'm a mind, I'm a writer mindset. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to like have this shift, which was something that happened with me. Like I remember during, um, during Grand Crew, I became a supervising producer. And I think you said something to me at one point, like somebody asked me something and I was like, I don't know, or like, that's not my job. And you were like, yes, it is Charlotte. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're a supervising producer. And it's just like, when did that happen? You know, it's just like, when did I go from having to be like, no responsibility, just pitch. That's funny. And now all of a sudden I am I'm sorry. in charge. I'm sorry you know? I gave you that job. No, I mean, thank you for being straight up with me, which is something I always appreciated. But it, it's a bumpy transition. How did you make that transition? What was it like for you? It's really, it's interesting. It happened gradually at Brooklyn even. And it's like, it was always a little bit of like an inside joke amongst like a few writers there. Cause it, if you're on a show long enough, like writers stay there and everyone gets familiar enough with the show that they can run a room. And I d- in an ideal world, you should have multiple people that can run rooms, at least at that level. It doesn't mean that they're like the ultimate decider or they're the number two to some degree, but like that just means that you've got a lot of people that have been there long enough and or have really just taken to the job well enough that they can kind of step up and do that. But I think that the, it's just like anything, it's like, there's a complicated relationship with it because you're like, Oh, this is more work. Yeah. A lot more work. <laughs> that was the, the start of it early on in Brooklyn where it starts happening and everyone's looking around and they're like, all right, who's, you know, like there's three of us in here that technically can run the room. If you haven't been told by the person, by like the showrunner who's running it, you're essentially rock, paper, scissoring for it or like someone's deciding that moment. And that's like, by the way, that's not how it should be. And I think Phil was always good. It's like this person's running the room. You know who it is. Right. That's like generally a bad vibe if like people don't know. But to the same Nobody point, it's knows like, what's happening. But it's at least emblematic of like, oh, yeah, everyone is like, I'm, everyone kind of knows that means it's more work that day if you're the one running yeah. the room and, and your pay yeah. doesn't change at all. So you are no. essentially being and so that, by the way, it sh- I'm not saying it should. I'm just saying like that is like essentially it's like, okay, I'm being paid the same no matter what happens today. I can either be the one in charge of the room. I think you're right. It's stupid for pay to come into it. But I think that that is like a little very sub sub layer of it where it's like, okay, my day started, my day started and it can go in a lot of different ways. And the amount of work I have to do can be on a whole array of different amounts of work. Right. Sometimes that can be really a positive thing once you get through it, or it can be like just really hard. And you're like, well, I could have yeah. not done that. And I still would have been paid the same. And that sometimes that's more fun. Right. So it's like, it's hard to know. I didn't even think about pay, but it's true. It's <laughs> true. And it's only because like once, you know, I, I'd never been in a room before where, you know, we were systematically, structurally kind of all tasked with running the room at a certain point, which means that at at a certain point, any one of us would be uh, leading the room to break story. So we, we would be like mm-hmm. making the decisions about how the story goes. And I remember just being so freaking nervous the first time that I had to do it. And I've been like in so many writers rooms, but Phil's room was the first time. And I can't wait to have Phil on, by the way, but you know, oh, give yeah. him a that's going to be a seminal episode. It, it really will be. <laughs> um, Phil's room was the first time that he basically made everyone run the room. I think that's, yeah. At some point, which was really amazing. It was amazing, but it was, terrifying (laughs) it's such a different job sitting in the chair and pitching versus leading the the story uh trajectory you know it it just made me feel so like exposed you really just feel like okay you want to get i mean it depends on what type of person you are but i think you and i are similar in this way and i think that's why we get along but i think we're both empaths to some degree And I think we want to be in that position and get the most out of everyone. We're not here trying to be like, okay, this is all about me. Now I, uh, you know, this is like a weird conversation of like, I want to do a good job for the person who put me in charge. So that's already an empathetic thing. I I don't want to let them down. It's not about me necessarily. I want to be great. Yeah. I want to present Phil with the best possible story. Yeah. I want them to shine. I want these other people in the room to like be able to feel like they can contribute and like, get the best out of them and they're having a good time on top of feeling positive about the experience, which is like a good mentality to a point to approach it. It's like, there's always the right level until it's crippling. It's like, right. you should absolutely want to get the best out of everyone. Cause that will only benefit you. And then of course, if you care too much about that, you might find yourself spiraling again, but there's always, it's always a balancing act every time you're, whether you're running the room or not to try and find your like, best place i would say you need to be as balanced as possible Your but best place that was definitely the the brooklyn transition was always the funniest because it started from like you know you can be in these rooms i don't think you were in grand crew i don't know about your other shows but like 
you can be kind of a mid-level, lower-level writer that's starting to be tasked with running a room when there's an upper-level person in that room because they haven't been there that long. And that's like complicated. Yeah, Pay is absolutely. involved with that, but it's just like yes. how experienced that it's a really weird thing and uh, that can happen. And so that would happen occasionally. Um, but, you know, I think what it was, this is like a really, again, a probably a privileged position to be in, but I think writers have to go through this is like any stage you are going through in your career, you sometimes have to grieve a former phase of it. Interesting. Essentially, like, I'm never going to get to experience positive or negative. Like, it can be a really good version of it. But you can, it can be a negative thing where sometimes you're feeling that where you're like, oh, that like three years where I had very little responsibility, could kind of punch above my pay grade, if you will, felt like I was really bonded with the people in it. Yeah. That's gone. Like I, I, that, you know, you'll maybe come back and forth between that, but you're just never going to get to experience that again. And I think I had like roughly one year that was like maybe one year at Brooklyn, like kind of feeling that like in between ism of it. And then I was like, okay, I have to just get used to the fact that like, yes, I might not be running the room every day, but this is going to be asked of me. I'm not going to be like coming in the day being like, is it today or not? I just need to know like it's possible so that I'm not going to like, live that like high wire act of like what's going to be expected of me that day you know right that's like a little bit of an in-between place until you get to a certain place so damn i wish you had given me this kind of like pep talk on grand crew <laughs> david i could have really used it <laughs> dang i thought i i, I wish Thanks i knew lot. you needed the pep talk <laughs> What? I I needed to know that I needed to grieve my old <laughs> position and now I have to just accept and be open to the fact that I have more responsibility yeah. now. I'm no longer in the, you know, baby staff writing stage. Yeah. And like for some people, I think it's a good grief because mm-hmm. I think they're like, I hated being yeah. a staff writer and I'm ready to move on. Yeah. Right. I'm ready to take control. Yeah. You have a very particular uh, style of running the room, and I want to talk about it when we come back. So we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll come back and talk about uh, your style. I'm quickly interrupting this episode to tell you about theworkingwriter.com. It's a resource I created for screenwriters and creative entrepreneurs that includes a blog, a course, and this podcast. Right now, when you sign up for the mailing list, you'll get my Get Repped mini course for free. I cover what agents and managers do, how to know when you're ready for a rep, and how to find the right rep for you. If you're working on breaking into TV, I hope it gives you some concrete steps to get to the next level in your journey. Go to theworkingwriter.com, that's W-E-R-K-I-N-G, and sign up for the mailing list now to download the Get Repped mini course for free. Now, back to the episode. So your style of running the room is very laid back. It's very like, uh, uh, you know, we would stop and, you know, uh, play games to get everyone's juices flowing again. You know, um, Phil, on the other hand, had a very kind of like fast paced, kind of like high energy way of running the room. Um, and I felt like one of the things that I really wanted to do, cause I, I definitely looked up to you a lot in the room, David, since you were number two, was that I kind of wanted to like create my own style of running the room. And I wanted mm-hmm. to know like, what was your, what's your philosophy when it comes to running a room and how did you develop such a laid back chill style? You know, that's really funny to say it that way. Cause I definitely probably didn't like overthink it, but if I were to like, think about it now retroactively i don't like being stressed by the person in charge so i just wanted to represent a version of someone that i would like to be in a room with and hopefully that that would you know i pick up on like vibes too i'm not entirely like you know maybe super unaware of like oh this person is maybe not feeling this i can only change so much but uh, you know i just i never liked the feeling of like holy shit, we just got an assignment. We don't know what we're looking at a blank page. And I, the feeling of that stress doesn't, I don't like that feeling, even though like everyone's going to feel that anyways, you don't need another person to put that on you. It's like everyone like already is going to go into the room and be like, holy crap, we have a lot to do. Um, And you know, like, I think a thing is too, once you've done it enough, you have the outside knowledge to be like, it, it gets done. Sometimes you fall a little bit too behind and you need to be on top of that and you don't want to feel like everyone's like really dreading because we're not going to get the work done. But like 
if you go in with the confidence of like, we're going to get it done, whether it happens at 10 30 AM or like three o'clock PM, that work can get done once you have an idea that splits it open in like five to 10 minutes. Like so much of like ideas get broken in these like quick jolts. It doesn't, you're not really looking at like a 10 30 to three o'clock day and be like, wow, we really like, really spent that entire time and like that was like the uh, all the six hours was it it's like there are these like ideas where suddenly within 10 minutes you're like oh this already starting to make sense at least sometimes that's how Mm -hmm. i see it and of course you kind of can't like sometimes there is just work ahead of you and you're like well we have a script in front of us and that i think is a different beast because when it's a script in front of you everyone sees the work ahead you just have to keep the vibes up it's less about like, yeah, that does just take long. You need to like pitch on jokes and there's a lot of work to do, but that should just be fun because if you want to get jokes, people need to be having fun. So I I can't imagine like, even if it's going to be quiet in the room, it should feel like a good quiet as opposed to like, oh, I'm nervous because no one's speaking and, you know, I'm worried that I'm being judged. It's like, I have to sometimes think about stuff. So as long as I show that that's okay, that should feel okay too. Um, but that's probably the Absolutely. core of it, but I, I probably didn't think of it as much as that, as much as to, to your point, like I probably witnessed a lot of people running rooms and be like, mm-hmm, I want to do this, but maybe not this or this. And like, it's just wouldn't work for me. I just don't know if I could like, Im- like put on this type of like person that would be different than who I am. So it's probably part just natural. If that makes sense. But I'm kind of curious, what's your vibe? What did you decide? Would My be your vibe, vibe is uh, uh, well. I definitely want to create a space where everyone feels like they're free to make a bad joke, pitch a bad pitch. I mean, obviously, pitch a great pitch. But I just think that I've been in too many rooms where people just didn't feel comfortable to to make a mistake, to say something that's not hilarious, <laughs> to say something that's not Absolutely. quite it, you know, because I think that like, you know, cause it's like a lot of the times we find the story when it's like somebody pitches something that's not quite there, but it's close. And, and that's what gets us over the edge and over the hump. I, I don't like people feeling, I guess, uncomfortable or unwelcome in any way. I really, really do think that that was one of the best things about the Grand Crew Writers Room was just this established, establishing this vibe of like everybody, you know, should feel comfortable to speak up, even if you're shy. That was another thing. Yeah, like even if some people are more shy, like some people are, are like not, so good at story or not so good at character or whatever like but they are really great at jokes or they are really great mm-hmm. at whatever and just whatever anyone was really good at to really encourage them to lean into that um lean into their strength so it's very similar to yours i think <laughs> yeah i mean i would say i 100% agree <laughs> with all that yeah so it has to be it has to be exactly the way i did it it has to <laughs> perfect right <laughs> well i mean that in essence i think what you're getting at is like in essence that's what it should be and how do you achieve that and everyone can it achieve that be. a little bit differently right. but it's like everyone right. should feel comfortable you need to be a competent enough person in charge that you can take this thing that might not be right but you can still frame it in a way or think about it in a way that it's not immediately like that doesn't work even if that person doesn't want like you don't have to always i think there's this weird misunderstanding where it's like uh consider every idea means like you have to like show people why the idea is wrong too you know if that makes sense like sometimes it helps to like go through the logic of it and explain it but sometimes people do just say stuff and they don't want to like spotlight on the like silly bad pitch like right, that i right. i'm speaking of myself like sometimes i'll say something and it's like i don't need you to like, yeah tell me all the reasons it's it's like right. maybe not Unpack working it. like sometimes yeah. it's just like laugh at it <laughs> you can laugh at it and move on and sometimes yeah. i think people enjoy that too so it's like you're said it's like it shouldn't I be like so. yeah it's like a it's an interesting combination of that um but it's not um it's not easy i think your style also lends itself to unexpected story you know, I always, one of the, another thing I really liked in being in your rooms would be that we would always kind of go somewhere that I didn't really expect. And it made me wonder like how your story brain works. Like, what are you aiming for? What are you even, if you're aiming for anything at all, like when you're, when you're breaking story? 
It's a great question. I probably wonder that myself every time. <laughs> I don't. I think my two. I have in in this way. I have like kind of two brains that are sometimes like my own. Like I have to check myself because sometimes there's too much of the math of it that I think people come in with. I think it's really important. This probably goes back to how to run a room. I think it's really important to be like. It's super super subjective and knowing that always so that anyone's like idea of what's working as a story is still their own idea and not like, Oh, this is actually factual and how stories work. And so my thinking there is like, yeah, sometimes I get into my own head and I'm like, oh, this, this just isn't how a story works. But in reality, it's like not how it's working for me, but eventually it will make sense to me. And so that can come from a lot of different ways. I think like, it it's hard when you have an A story and those things sometimes need to be justified a little bit more than a C story that doesn't really need to have like character motivations and can just be funnier. But I think the biggest thing that I was aware of going into Grand Crew was just challenging myself to forget some of the structure that existed at Brooklyn. Not in that Brooklyn was bad, but more like this is an open space it doesn't have to exist as strictly in those ways that a story works at Brooklyn. And since I wrote there for seven seasons, that was just sometimes a default. Um, and one of the big ones that I probably just even mentioned was like, actually there doesn't have to be an A, B and C. These can be all three B's or three, you know, we can call them what they are and it's just like, follow the mm -hmm. funny idea until it's no longer funny. And that became a little bit more interesting to me whenever we could push that. And I wouldn't always be ahead of that. I would have to remind myself of that. Sometimes Phil would be the one. It's like we would both work off each other. It's like if Phil got two in his head about it, I would be the one being like, hey, this doesn't have to be seven beats just because it's technically our main story. If it only has five beats, we do right. five beats and that's fine. And it can break. The story can break at different places. So it was a lot of the times reminding myself, what will make these stories interesting is what, like, what is the core idea that we're really liking and yeah. tell it in the amount of beats that it needs. So that would maybe, to your point, end up being like, we can treat it a little bit more like if this, then what else? And we can fit in like two or three more funny ideas that maybe it, we would naturally be like, oh, well this needs more like of an emotional arc or whatever. And I would sometimes be like, I don't know if it does. <laughs> I would just like, that would be the, the, my two brains fighting. Is that like, it's like, what is this? What does this character want is a constant question you ask yourself in breaking these stories, um, which helps get you through the, like sometimes the doldrums of when a scene's not working, but uh, oftentimes you can still come from an external place that I think people would say isn't the way to do it. You could still come from a place of like, you know what? It will still just be funny if this character is, I wish I had the best explanation off the top of my head, whatever some of those like comedy driven scenes. Okay. Perfect example. Episode three of season two was written backwards in a lot of ways from the, the ass eating concept and that scene. <laughs> and that you know like i think that's okay i think we can be like that was really funny yeah. we can make that work and we can we like want to eat ass in this episode yeah. <laughs> we, we started laughing when the idea of someone was yeah. crying while eating someone's ass if you can say right. all of that and we were like well that's an interesting like that was phil who came up like we were in the middle of this like post breakup story and that sort of broke it all open and that reoriented the whole thing um, and I think you need to be like open to being like, just because it doesn't immediately work in as you imagined it, you can still write towards these things that might not seem as like, oh, this is starting from a place of like, we are telling just the story of yeah. someone getting over a breakup. Um, I think I rambled a little bit there, but I wish I had like a better mantra. I would say it's it always comes back to the annoying thing. Well, I'm going to I'm going to give you another opportunity. Okay. Cuz I want to keep talking about this cuz I I did think that the way that you Dan Gore and Phil Jackson you know broke down story, I found it very like um 
just like, I don't want to say like mechanical or like <laughs> robotic, but it was just like very like, what is the word? It was just math? like very like, yeah, <laughs> you guys kind of treated like it like an equation, me. like math. Yeah, I know. Sometimes it just felt like you guys were 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 like doing an equation. And Dan has this way that it seems like you, you and Phil were also trained under him through Brooklyn mm-hmm. to think of story this way too. Like he would always describe a uh, story as basically stories we've always seen before. Like he would describe, oh, this is like planes, trains, and automobiles. Like that's this story. This is Cicero, or this is <laughs> like, um, it's basically a story we've seen before. So mm-hmm. That in itself was something that I found really interesting because I'd never really looked at TV stories that way, that they're essentially retellings of stories we've seen and that we all already kind of know. Do you approach story that way because of the way that you've been trained by Dan? Or do you also think that this is a a good way to to break story or to, to think about TV stories? Uh, methodical. That's a good I question. think that was the way, the way that I was thinking. Of. I was thinking methodical. That was the word. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. Well, it's a good question because it gets back to the thing that I was saying about sort of like my my sort of worrying with myself about it because I definitely learned how Dan does story, and that doesn't mean that I was perfect at it, yeah. but I could kind of sometimes know what that would be, and not even just actually like it was even more specific. It was like how Dan does story for Brooklyn, which when you leave something after yeah. seven years, I think like everyone would say like, if you stop writing for yourself in a lot of ways, you're like, Oh, well this is now how I'm like used to writing these things. And I, I kind of wanted to break that down a little bit. And I would say, yeah, I, I think that like the, the <laughs> secret to a lot of TV writing is you have to find things that like seem familiar to then twist on it you know i think a lot of tv writing is like okay this is the familiar way that this story would be done now what's our twist and then oh someone already did that twist what's that then how do we do the twist you know it's like you're building on blocks of like all these things in the past and i think people are more okay with that in tv because you watch a lot of episodes like people want some familiarity to some degree and but i would say that even in movies that's that's probably true there's a lot of like multiple totally. of the same kinds of movies. And sometimes if that's just the kind of movie you like, you, you'd be willing to watch 10 versions of it. And so I think like reference points are so key to viewers that they also are key to writing as well. And, but I don't come from it as like the starting place. I think that sometimes we notice it in the middle of it. And I think also sometimes it's a little bit patting ourselves on the back. It's not always, there were always these like, there, this would happen at Brooklyn or, and probably sometimes at Green Crew, like you witness the plane, trains, and automobile thing, where you're like, oh, we're using this as a reference point now. But it's no longer even really accurate. It's like, if you've seen this movie that we're referencing, it's like, this has been fully removed from the whole story. I don't even remember, you know, there were just like times where I'd be like, oh, yeah. we're referencing this thing as a way of like how we're telling this story. But now it's just our own version of a thing that's not even close to that anymore. It's like, Plane trains actually kind of stayed in there because it was mostly just like, oh, they're on a journey where things go wrong. But it's like, you know, mm-hmm. theoretically, the only thing they ended up on was a, a train. They didn't end up on a plane. <laughs> or they, right. they ended up in an automobile. And we, we are talking about uh, episode one. One. Your of episode. Season two of, of season Grand two. Crew. My episode. We, we referred to it as plane trains, planes, trains, and automobiles because they were, you know, they're on planes and they were on auto- automobiles and trains. Automobiles too and um, trains. And yeah, it was a way of referencing because yeah. there were like three different paths at one right. point, right? Where it was like, do we want to tell right. a story about him getting married? There was already like, it was like, does he get married? Does he not get married? That already created like two different, that was, right. honestly, season two had in many ways worse elements of a season one that you would say where it was like, we could do anything, whatever, but it was still just, Right, and right. overthinking of all the different outcomes. But that I think was is right. instrumental to what storytelling is sometimes where you're like it could we always like to think that there's this structure we're chasing to make it make sense for us to make the process easier. But unfortunately it still can be anything. And so that's I think just another way of yeah. trying to trying to narrow it down for us so it doesn't feel 
so vast that it crushes you and makes you like indecisive to a point where you right. can't figure something out. It's like what seems like either the funniest thing to start building something around if it can carry the weight of a story or what's the most interesting thing from a character perspective. And I think I started with Grand Crew feeling like I'm more interested in seeing like either a comedic moment or a story choice, but not necessarily like a character's thing, just because you're like, I don't know, it's all recognizable stuff. And I think what's making Grand Crew interesting is like, the jokes are going to be funny no matter what. And it's like, there will be just the one or two moments in the episode that you remember that for. And I think that's how I always thought of sitcoms that I liked anyways. You're just like, oh, that episode where, you know, in Friends, they took the quiz. That episode was called like the one with the embryos because it was had like a story with yeah. Phoebe <laughs> getting her eggs uh, thing. But it's like, oh, the thing you remember is just like they did a quiz where it's about like their friendship or whatever. Yeah. And so you're like, oh, that was like a, a funny detour and essentially a story that was not about that at all. Um, but again, that was a long rant again. I, I really do wish... I think that I think I'm just a little bit combative with myself about being in some of those really strict hardline this is how story work rooms and realizing that mm -hmm. it is helpful to a point. It's not as it is it's not as like a bible as you think it is. You know, I was in Rick and Morty, I saw the story circle. Dan definitely has his own ways of doing it, but that that's really almost a way of like checking it after the fact. I've so often it's like you're pitching yeah. on the story and then you're like, now we're testing the story that it works once we've written it down on that. You know, it's not always a good place to start from. Right. My, my mythology is like, let's find the most interesting thing. My last question for you then is if I'm David Phillips and I'm developing a new idea, uh, what, what do you have to offer? What do you have to offer me, David? You know, as a writer, I'm trying to break a new story idea. Got it. What kind of like advice do you offer when someone is, is you know, is putting putting their idea pen to paper? Great question. For a second, I got so nervous that you were asking me to have to come up with a new idea and do something. So I'm so much happier to just give advice. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's a tough one. Um I would say one that's always been good advice is just do it. So it's like, don't live in your head for as long as, you know, you're living in your head. I think you'll always live in your head longer than you need to with like, it always helps to respond to the idea of getting it down. Um, but yeah, if you're, you know, someone like me, that's like, uh, just, you know, you're going to find what makes your version of it interesting along the way. It doesn't always have to come from the original core concept of the idea. Um, and you don't have to come up with something that's like, I, I think that like things have shifted in a way where there was this big thing of like, I need some like big splashy thing that like feels so novel or whatever. And it's like what you said, a lot of ideas exist. So if you think about it as like, you're the one who's making it novel that's a pretty good place to root from. Like either are you telling the story from a place that's like actually grounded in your experience? Great. Cause that's obviously important, but you can also just take something that you've seen before and make it novel just through your lens of it. So it doesn't have to be this like super uh, splashy selling, almost cynical way of looking at it. You know what, try and show what's funny to you and whatever you do. I mean, that was ultimately when I had my best luck of writing, which was like either in a pilot or like a sketch that I would do. It's like, ultimately, like I had to, you had to be able to be like, Oh, this is why I'm doing this. This is the funny thing that I liked when it comes to comedy. So that you will theoretically never forget, I guess like things will age poorly and you'll be like, Oh, this sucked. But you're like, Oh, I do remember that I thought that was funny. And I still kind of do think that was funny. But everything else around <laughs> it maybe does suck. But yeah, that, you know. But yeah, that's from a comedy writing perspective. David Phillips, you're the best. Thank you so much for being on the pod. It's such a treat to get to be on here.
Bye bye. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that episode with David Phillips. And I hope you learn that you can make it in Hollywood too, even if you're also from Beverly Hills. All kidding aside, I do hope you enjoyed that episode and got a lot out of it. And until next time, get out there, get to work. There's no way I could do this podcast alone. I wanted to give a big shout out and thank you to our editor, Justin Asher, and to our other production assistants, Jemima Lariston, Maya Racole, and Nicole Edwards. Oh, 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 oh,